Hey everybody, it's time for another piece of ash. This is my weekly show uh, where I sit and talk. Uh, we usually wax philosophical with the wargaming industry and I take questions from the chat and the mailbag. Um, this week, I'm gonna be working on some stuff while we chat. Uh, I have a, uh, the last model for my, um, what is it? This is the uh, Fractadrock Troop from the Onyx Army Deal uh, that I'll be using in a battle report I'm filming this weekend for Infinity. I'm doing this thing where I'm going through all the 300 point armies for Infinity and um, just trying them out because <laughs> I think they're great. Uh, Infinity is one of those games where um, for both retailers and um, players, it can be very daunting to try and get into it and start playing. And I found that the 300 point army boxes, and I have a giant Infinity collection, um, are great for just sort of demystifying factions, teaching you how to play, um, and letting you get a grip on how an army works without having to try and make a bunch of decisions and getting a bunch of things wrong because you don't want to try and figure some stuff out on your own. It's good to have a, a jumping off point. Much like the um, Operation Ice Storm, Operation Red Veil boxes are a, a great place to start too. So this was the only model I hadn't painted for my 300 point army yet. So I'm gonna put her together and play her on the weekend. Um, and then I've got some of the Oryx for Shadespire. Uh, this is the three out of four now. The, the first two are in the box game and these are the first two expansion warbands I picked up. Um, the Sepulchral Guard, which are the skeletons, beautiful skeleton miniatures, uh, and then also these Oryx who are just super cool Orc Brutes um, on 32 mil bases. I thought they'd be on 40s for some reason. I thought they'd be on bigger bases, but they're not. They're just on 30 mil bases. And they look a lot like, a lot more actually like the old Black Orcs from the Warhammer Fantasy game than they do the current, um, Iron Jaws, I believe it's called, the, the orcs in the big like pseudo power armor or whatever, those are the Iron Jaw brutes that are kind of like the Terminator versions of these. These look like black orcs, which is nice. They're, they're very Brian Nelson-y. Um, I don't think Brian Nelson sculpted them because they've been done digitally, but they, they have that Brian Nelson vibe. Uh, one thing I will say that's interesting is the feet are actually cast on the bases, which is kind of different. I've seen a lot of people trying to take guys off the bases and these guys, of all of the models in, in Shadespire so far, you cannot do that too. <laughs> they are, their bases come with them. Um, so the title of the show this week uh, actually dovetails nicely into this little project here. It's going to be talking about why are all the miniature board gaming companies trying to get into miniature board games. Um, and this is an interesting industry phenomenon because um, this is something that I've talked about before. I don't know if I've talked about it in this show before. Um, but I've talked about it definitely with people at conventions and just talking about the Wargaming market before. And I've talked about it a lot actually with my friends who are game designers uh, because it's something that I, I, I firmly believe is a phenomenon currently taking place in the market. Um, and this, this sort of like, I don't say dash, but this like push by so many companies all at the same time into the miniature board gaming market I think is indicative of there being some truth here. Um, and, and it's a big thing I call money over time. And to get started about it, it's got three parts, but you have to understand something called um, uh, Venn diagrams. And if you guys don't understand what Venn diagrams are, I'm sure lots of you out there do, I'll give you a quick overview of what it is. is uh, you'll see in the video description, we're talking about circles. And all these circles represent, in this case, a market segment. So people who are in a different position and who want something typically different. And what you try and do when you make a product is always these cir circles overlap because people have things in common, right? So in this case, for instance, the amount of money that someone might have that's disposable to spend on leisure products might be the same, but the amount of free time they have isn't the same as someone in a different circle. So one circle has lots of free time, lots of money, lots of money, lots of free time, big circle. I call those people people in their early 20s. <laughs> and when I say lots of free time and lots of money, it doesn't mean lots of money in the sense that they're rich, but when you're in your 20s, you don't have a car, you don't have a family, you don't have a lot of responsibility, you're much more likely to spend a big chunk of your paycheck on things that make you happy than you are on things that you just have to pay money for, <laughs> right? On stuff that you just straight up have to pay money for. Um, things like your, uh, your mortgage, your kids' braces, whatever it is. So that's the first circle in the Venn diagram. Now the next circle is people who have lots of free time and no money, and those are kids. So uh, we can all remember being that kid who might have had a job like I might have had a job, you know, when I was like, well, I didn't have a job when I was like between the ages of 13 and 21, um, but I didn't pay a ton of money, but I did have tons of free time. And so I was very willing to spend time and engage time with things that made me happy, right? So a lot of that time was, you know, chasing girls, skateboarding, going to parties with friends, um, and of course, playing games, playing, playing miniature war games, playing video games, playing whatever. Um, those are the like, it's okay to stay up until four o'clock in the morning, and I don't even know if kids do this anymore, play, having a LAN party with your friends. Everybody, everybody drags their computer over to everybody else's house and you sit up in the basement and you order pizza and you play like 
we played like Counter Strike and we played Unreal Tournament and stuff until like four o'clock in the morning or whatever um, for a weekend. You know, we just lock ourselves in somebody's basement for a weekend and like just drink and, <laughs> and play video games. Um, so, so, so that's the other market segment. So you've got lots of free time, no money. You've got lots of free time, lots of money. And then over here, you've got lots of money, no free time. And, and these three circles, they do overlap, right? Um, and when you make a product, you're, you're either trying to make it specifically for one, or you're trying to make it where there's the most overlap. And most products tend to, in this, in this market, try and attack people who have a relative amount of free time. But the further you go up that scale, the more money people typically tend to have on things to make them happy. Um, and that's why things like mass combat games, big combat games and combat systems, or things that take a lot of time to play, set up, tear down, get ready to play, they tend to target the middle of that circle, right? Where there's an overlap of, you've got just enough free time, just enough disposable income, um, and just enough desire to play that game. But these miniature board games, what's interesting about them is they're actually targeting that far segment, that far circle of people who, more like me, um, have less free time, disposable income, so we have money that we're willing to spend on things that make us happy, which is probably about the same as when we were in our 20s, because as we develop over time, typically, most people, of course, there's always outliers, this, this is a, a generalization in the market, this isn't saying that this is true for everybody, but most people tend to have more money as they get older, they progress in their careers, they have savings, they, whatever it is that ends up, you know, building you in your, in your course of your life so you have more disposable income. At the same time, shrinking that disposable income by having responsibility. Um, so, so there's a whole market segment at the end there that most miniature war games kind of push out because miniature war games are very time intensive. They don't necessarily let you um, instantly be gratified by them and play them. And so if you look at things like Aristia, if you look at things like the new Guild Ball kickoff box, it's not new anymore, it's like a year old now. Um, if you look at things like Shadespire, all of these are targeting that far circle. And the reason for that is there's not a lot of things in the miniature war game market that do but that market is there and that market is huge. For instance, one of the most successful things I can think of targeting that market currently that's in the hobby leisure board game, you know, get together and collectively play something together market would be something like Cards Against Humanity. Cards Against Humanity made an unbelievable amount of money based on the idea that it was quick to play, it got people to socialize and sit in front of each other and it hit exactly that target market. Lots of money, no free time, so you can play it anywhere. And it became the party game hit of that year, and probably for several years after that, where you're playing Cards Against Humanity with people that would never play a board game. And these guys delved into and found a big target market of people that had money, they liked the idea of playing games, like playing board games, but they didn't have a lot of free time. Quick to set up and tear down board games, things like Carcassonne, Settlers of Catan, also a lot of their success is based on the fact that they don't take a lot of time to engage with. And so there is a big market segment out there that isn't currently being penetrated by the current wargaming industry. And so it makes sense that they're trying to make products now to try and attract this part of the market, this, this category of people, basically consumers, who might like miniature wargaming. They might love the idea of doing it, but because they're put off by the amount of investment of their own time that has to go into it, they're not necessarily gonna become subscription customers, people that are gonna be doing business with them for a long time. And so, there's a, big, there's a big gap, I think, in between something like Cards Against Humanity and something like uh, Warhammer, where there isn't currently an in-between product. And that's why you see that empty hole being filled by all of these new neat products that are a little bit of board game, a little bit of miniature board game, and they, they, they bridge that gap. They try and find that money and draw that, that customer base into the miniature board game market and make them customers of that business. So it's very interesting because right now, there's not a lot of open ground in the miniature wargaming market. There's not a lot of things that there isn't a game for out there. I'm spoiled for choice for spaceship games, for skirmish games, for fantasy skirmish games, post-apocalyptic skirmish games. The market is getting very crowded with products. So what's happening instead is, companies aren't looking to try and go deeper into the same market that they're in. What they're trying to do is go wider and try and find a niche that isn't currently being occupied by another business. And so that's where you see these initial sort of pushes into this market. I think a lot of them are really aggressive. Shades is really aggressive, of course, lots of marketing behind it. Um, it's been done with exactly that stuff in mind, easy to play, colored plastic miniatures. They mostly push fit. If I didn't, if I was just gonna snap these off the sprue, I wouldn't really need glue. They're all peg and groove. They can all just be put together by pushing them together.
together. I'm not gonna stay together forever, but I didn't need a lot of hobby experience to just get this ready to play. And they're all made from an accessibility point of view where I can be playing a game and have a satisfying experience with that game and wanna play it again in 25 minutes to half an hour. So it, it's, a, it's an un, untapped vein, basically, of potential consumers out there that a lot of these companies are aggressively going after. So I hope that made sense. Uh, let's talk about it in the chat. If you guys wanna talk about it in the comments afterwards when you're watching this video in the future, um, I'll happily read through and respond, see what you think about that. Um, and uh, yeah, let's dive in. I'm gonna say hi to everybody in the chat. I'm gonna start building some toy soldiers. Uh, we'll take some questions from the chat and then jump into the mailbag. We're about, oh geez, we did pretty good. I, I, I got through all that in 10 minutes. I got through all that talking in 10 minutes um, without breaking down. So let's go and see who's here. I actually, it's funny because I set up for this one really early. Um, I made a point of uh, getting this, like like the event scheduled basically, because I had to figure out how to do this in 1080p because I hate it when YouTube had an update. And so the way that you schedule videos now has totally changed again. And the default standard, I was like, do this as a one-off, whatever. Okay, great, yeah, it's gonna be one-off video, it's perfect. Clicked it and it auto chooses ingestion settings for you and just shows 240p and like the last video just looks like, I mean, you're mostly just doing this to listen to me talk, it doesn't really matter, but it just looks like ass. 240p, it's like my phone can do better than that. <laughs> I'm sitting here with a setup of like, you know, tons of camera equipment and lights and all that stuff and like, I'm shooting out the worst quality of YouTube video basically because YouTube decided to and because I couldn't control it. So this time around, I made sure I got in early, I scheduled it, I dug into where the, the settings are that I can actually do a 1080p output, and we're, we're, back, to, we're back to Robert is your father's brother, um, as they say in these dens, um, and, uh, and everything's, everything's working out okay. Or it seems to be, because I'm actually watching myself on my laptop right now, and I see myself in 1080p, so it doesn't, doesn't appear to have messed up again this time around. So let's see, so people, we had people who were here super early, like BFD HUD, <laughs> Dimitri Appenden, uh, Dave Rockefeller's here, Dave Rockefeller's been hanging up for a while, Brutalitops is here, Quinn Murphy says hi, but she had to run off to go to class, so hi Quinn, if you see this in the future, I uh, hope you had a good class. Uh, 12 Neef's here, uh, Anthony Lee's here, Andy Grease, Green's here, uh, doo -doo -doo, who else is here, Ben, Grandpa and Nurgle's here. I'm actually gonna be playing Ben on the weekends, we're gonna be playing some Malifaux's. Uh, which I'm gonna try and paint a new warband for this week. I have so much to paint this week though. <laughs> but I'm trying to do it anyway. I'm gonna try and try and crack out new warbands. Um, who else is here? Uh, Mike Grimshaw's here, Teo's here. Uh, he says the LVO is amazing. Yeah, cool, I'm, I'm sure it is. Don't think it's for me. Kelly Merrill's here. Uh, Jonathan Lowry's here. Mele Avedi Shinobi's here. Uh, and Miso Miso's here. Chaotic Flanagan's here. Uh, Cat Flanagan asks, yo Ash, did you get a new webcam? It looks a lot clearer than normal. No, I just actually put some lights up this time around. So I've properly lit this. I, it's funny because I've had these lights literally sitting on a shelf in the studio and I just keep forgetting to do them. There's a, there's a really simple trick to lighting sit and talk videos like this. That a lot of people just don't do, but because we're sitting in my, my like living room, the lighting is very ambient in here anyway. It doesn't really, it's not appropriate for video at all. So I have a two light setup that I was just meaning to bring in forever that's now set up and I can use forever. And so you'll be able to see me much better because I'm using a proper lighting setup for this. Uh, Darth Deplorables here. Uh, who else? Jonathan Baudry Lottenville's here. Uh, Inquisitor Shavax here. Kelly Merrill's here and says, wow. Uh, Gilbert Tethen 2 Magimon91834 said two dollars. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means either. Uh, oh, it's Super Chat, it's Super Chat. They just they just tipped me, thank you. That's weird, I've never had anybody do that before. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. Um, yeah, Super Chats turned on because that, that was like a thing for this, but I didn't realize that that's what actually popped up when that worked because I've never seen it happen before. Uh, Russell say, Higgins says, because it's guaranteed income owner over time for a property. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, you must be answering something I said and I've not realized what I've said. 676 six, Mitch says, you need a great big Chesterville chair in your living room. Well, I've got the club chair over there, which I love, but unfortunately, you know what's funny? That chair, it's that red chair back there is like my favorite chair. It's my painting chair. Whenever I'm doing any of my painting, I'm sitting in that chair. Um, the only problem is that it's starting to explode. Like it's, it's a really old antique chair. I actually got it when I bought my condo in Memphis and it's been like everywhere with me since then, <laughs> but it's starting to like, it's getting really old. I need to get it restored and it needs to be recovered for sure because between my kids and my cats, it's not in great shape anymore, but that chair is like the best chair. Unfortunately, I I couldn't do a sit and talk show in this chair. I'm sitting in a dining room chair right now. Like it's it's way 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 more like I sit up straight and and can actually do this show that way. Um, and he said you look like a king. <laughs> 
Uh, Inquisitor Shabak immediately says, a big nice chair would get ruined in days because I have kids. You know, <laughs> this guy gets it. I can't have nice things. I have like I have like 14 more years until I can have nice things. And even then they'll come home on a weekend to do laundry and like I won't be able to have nice things for the weekend or whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't get to have nice things. <laughs> mm. Teo says put a big plastic cover over it. Yeah, you know how long, you have kids, Teo. Dude, you got, you know, you know how long that would last. It wouldn't be good at all. Uh, the Castle Friendly, she says, it's good to see companies circle back around to board games. I started with GW's original Space Hulk and that got me sucked into Rogue Trader. Exactly. I think that right there is testimony to why bridging market gaps, like trying to fill in market gaps, where there's people out there that might love your property or your universe or your company, but you're not getting to them because what you make in some way is incompatible with the way that they enjoy the leisure activities. So just time, just time in general is a huge one, which again, I think is one of the reasons why you've saw board games blow up again in the last like 10 years. One, because it became very hip and hipster and cool to like like retro things in the early 2000s and mid 2000s. Um, and, and that was a thing that was retro, right? Board games weren't super popular, but but it was their lack of popularity that made them sort of hipster cool. You know what I mean? Like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go hang out at the board game cafe. You've probably never heard of it. Was, would it be like the slogan basically for the reason why people would go and do that? Um, and so it's it's interesting. I think I think that that's it's just being recognized now by these larger companies as oh here's a bridge to people we don't normally get to talk to. Let's let's build that bridge. And even if it doesn't make us a ton of money from our initial customers, that's okay because people are going to climb over that bridge to come see us and, and maybe become customers in other ways. And we'll see what happens. Misa Misa says the big Kickstarters like uh, Kingdom Death or Gloomhaven are popular as you get physical things. You get a lot of campaign content and your IP is usually niche but has incredible art which makes it stand out. Yeah, I know for sure. I think that um, you also think of things like Zombie Side, right? Zombie Side was a miniature board game that, that did really well because it had tons of pop culture references built into it. It was just enough a board game where the board gamers like it. It had tons of miniatures in it, which miniature board gamers liked. And I think that people who've really stood out in that niche right now are companies like Kumani or not, whose even their war games tend to be more towards the miniature board game side. Um, than they are towards the, the, the mass market war game side. Uh, and, that's, and that's great because they're, they're bridging into a market gap that nobody else has really, has really ventured into right now. And now you've got other companies trying to get into it, trying to push into that gap. Games Workshop's had some of that stuff for years. Blood Bowl is not a miniature war game. It's a board game played with miniatures. And that's, it's funny because it's probably their most enduring and lasting property when it comes to just constantly being out there in the market. People making third party miniatures for it, third party pitches for it, tons of events and activities happening for it. And it might be the, not the most beloved, like things like Space Hulk are very well remembered, but there weren't sp like 500 person Space Hulk tournaments happening, you know, for 10 years for an unsupported game that people weren't, weren't you know, um, weren't able to buy off the shelf. Like you had to either download the rules for free, make your own pitches, make your own miniatures, whatever. Um, I think that's an interesting, an interesting thing is that it's not a market that they've never been in before, but it's not one that they've really aggressively explored like they are now. Uh, Maylove says, land parties still happen, but they're definitely more rare. My buddies were over until 12 a.m. playing Shadow War though, and that was legit, <laughs> for sure. I mean, that's, that's funny, because again, that's the thing that you do when you're young, is you, sorry, I had a shower after I, I made lunch for the kids, so like my hair's all wet right now. So I keep playing with my hair. Um, is the, uh, the the just like that free time to like have buddies over until 12 o'clock. I couldn't do, I'd be like so afraid the kids would wake up. I'd just be like quietly like, shut up, shut up, shut up, you can't do it, shut up. <laughs> um, oh geez, what's happening? Oh, people are people are trying to text me, so I'm gonna put this over here. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a whole other like just free time to to to, to life <laughs> thing. Um, Daniel Sprinkle says, "Got to run and pick up my middle kid, which will catch up once I get back, probably after you're done." We'll see you in a bit, Daniel. S. Monsoor says, "The new Necromunda looks interesting." I absolutely agree. Um, I think it's going to be really cool. I'm excited. There's a new way to play it too, because again. It's a miniature board game. It's it's really interesting. They're really committing to this market where you can play it as a board game or you can play the the, the, the first expansion, the Underhive Gang War expansion, is gonna be the, the old traditional way of doing it in 3D terrain, all that stuff. And I'm absolutely gonna play both. It's funny, because I'm not this like purist where like the old way is always better, I'm always gonna do the old way. I don't care. I, I'm excited to have a new way to try to play Necromunda. I'm excited to have a new miniature board game to try on top of being able to play the old traditional Necromunda way too. I'm just going to have more miniatures to play it with. Uh, Jonathan Young says, wife isn't interested in wargaming per se, but she likes Imperial Assault and stuff and she's kind of interested in Shadespire. I think Shadespire is great because even, even Imperial Assault is probably 
probably 50% again longer to play than Shade Spires. Even a match play game of Shade Spire, you're playing twice to see who, who gets the best two out of three, it would probably take under half as much time as it does to play a game of Imperial Assault. Um, even just the setup time. Like the setup time for Shade Spire is nothing. Like you just, you're, you're, it's, it's actually part of the game to set the game up and it takes no time. And it's super rewarding, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then we got Shade Spire is, sorry, Jonathan Young says, Shade Spire and such are small enough and cheap enough for me to collect all the armies and the wife boy and I can play. Absolutely. And what's cool is it actually supports that too. There's three and four player modes for Shade Spire, um, for Aristaya. For a lot of these games, they're not leaving out the idea that you want more than two people to actually play the game. So they become party games. They become kitchen table games where the whole family can sit together or a group of people can sit together and try and play the game. You're not leaving, like, leaving anybody out. Uh, Inquisitor Shavak says, why do you always get one dislike? It's your wife or friends like Mini Wargaming Steve trying to keep you humble? Oh, it's probably, it's definitely Steve. 100%. He's just sitting on his phone, just, just disliking everything I do. <laughs> 100% Steve. No, it's the internet, man. Like, there's people out there that I've said something or I've done something at some point that has not sat right with them, and they just make a point of, of going and doing that. Some people just... Some people just don't feel good without making other... without trying to make someone else feel bad during the day. Um... And I just don't care. <laughs> like all that, all that dislikes do on YouTube for the most part is they just get you more engagement. So someone disliking someone is almost as good as someone liking something. It's just like commenting. If someone like comments to like shit talk on your YouTube videos, it just pushes it up in the metrics again. They're not doing. They're just. They're just doing you favors. They're getting more people to see it and engage and talk with it. So like, it's like it's sad that like there is no such thing as bad publicity and on the internet, but there really just isn't. Like. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Don't matter. Um, but yeah, it's totally Steve. Gotta be Steve, 100%. Uh, no, Steve's too busy sitting at work playing more time. <laughs> uh, what else we got? We've got Simon Jones saying, I'll totally be using the Sepulchral Guard in Frostgrave too. 15 pounds for JB Skeletons, yes please. And they're not just like okay skeletons either. They're probably some of the nicest skeletons Games Workshop's ever made. Which is crazy, because the last box of skeletons, I was like, these. I, I painted those for Frostgrave, and I was super happy with them, because they were some of the nicest skeletons I think I just painted ever. Um, and I'm I'm really jazzed for these new ones, too. Like, they, they're really, really nice. Who else we got here? Tau Breezy says, Slick Rick. All right. Mitch Fergay says, yo, yo, yo. Mitch Fergay is here. Um, Inquisitor Fax says, GW is a distinct advantage with one of the most solid backgrounds in history that isn't movie-driven in the whole main core game. Um, with specialist type stuff. So, yeah, I think so. I think I, I think that's that's a, a thing they've cultivated though, you know what I mean, over time is they've they've built their world. And I think they've come to understand that the most valuable thing they own is their intellectual property. And you can see that in the fact that they're willing to run it out. They're willing just to, to, to even entertain the idea of doing intellectual property. Like they make tons of money every year off of renting what they do to other people. And and that simple fact I think is them is them learning and then proving to others that 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 what they own is valuable, <laughs> and so they can make all kinds of games based on their IP. I think what I'm really excited about for for them and about them is that they're actually they're making new things, they're making new properties, they're they're making games that they haven't made before. It's not let's do the next version of this codex. I get really bored of 40k that way. I, 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 the fact that like 40k had this amazing like like marketing build up to it, but we're just back to kind of the the usual the usual cycle of like oh what's in the new codex oh yeah cool that's gonna break the game yeah it's it's just that cycle of like let's be excited about the next thing let's be excited about the next thing let's be excited about the next thing, but it's not different <laughs> you know like it's it's already gotten into a pattern it's already even gotten into a marketing pattern where you can you can see the formula they're following to to push things forward and be excited about it and that's okay i mean it but but what i'm more excited about is these crazy marketing schemes for things like necromunda like the marketing platform that they had this cool commercial for it that was like super punk rock and like had crazy music in it like it was just very like a, an off not an off note but a new note for gw and I love that. Like I love seeing, I love seeing them experiment and try new things, even if it's with an old property like Necromunda to play it in a new way. It just means they're innovating, and that's what that's what you want to see in a company. You want to see a company doing something different. I think a lot of people get put off by or worried when companies don't just make the same thing over and over again. But that's healthy. That's that's what you want. That's how you get your next favorite game. Um, I get really, I get really sad for people that are like, "Oh, nothing was as good as it used to be," and uh, this was the high point of everything. And this is the only game I'll play because I'm like, 
why did you stop trying new things? Like, what, what happened to you that you just stopped being excited about learning something new or doing something new? I think that's a, a, a sad thing, a sad thing just for a, um, uh, whatchamacallit, for a, uh, a, a hobbyist even to be into. Uh, Blade Wolf 9 says, throw up the likes to make the one like dislike go away. Whatever. Like, I'm not, I'm seriously not worried about that. Some people just want to watch the world burn. Yeah. Oh, Blade Wolf 9, I did enjoy the others. I haven't seen that actually up close yet. Um, but I've seen the, the, like, the art for it and stuff. That's the one with the demons, isn't it? Where it's like a demonic apocalypse and, like, everyone's possessed. And it had kind of a, uh, uh, uh what was that? The, the Atari remake of Alone in the Dark kind of a feel to it where you're kind of running around the city and there's possessed firemen and like possessed whatever and you're trying to fight spider people and whatever. It was really neat. I liked it because it was, a, it was a very different take on stuff. Um, Tao says, the wife wants Clint Escher to paint. For sure, they're great minis. Dan Harris says, what's up? Uh, who else we got? S. Monster says, any thoughts on WizKids and GW? Um, I don't think, I mean, there's really no thoughts to have. Yeah, it's just an announcement saying they're going to work together. Um, I think it's been really funny to watch everybody be like, ah, this is it, pre-painted Spice Marines, blah, 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 blah. Because, like, it's not, no one's going to ever be allowed to make Space Marines except GW. That's, here, let's just, let's just get that out of the way. There's not going to be anybody, there's nobody going to be making GW miniatures except Games Workshop. Because Games Workshop doesn't, doesn't do that. They don't, they don't let other people make miniatures. You can't claim to be the company that makes the highest quality toy soldiers in the world if you let somebody else make toy soldiers. And Forge World doesn't count because it's a wholly owned subsidiary. It's not a different company. Um, they're just Games Workshops with a different name. So I, I think what's happening with WizKids, and this is just a guess on my part, but you had, you had Games Workshop part ways with... Um, Fantasy Flight Games, you know, amicably, like the, the license is done and they, they part ways. So you got nobody making things like Dark Heresy um, or the Talisman game or all these old school board games that were licensed at that point. And WizKids is an alter a, a logical next alternative to that. They got some history and that kind of stuff. Um, they do a, a, you know, a passable like tabletop market stuff with their Dice Masters, which is basically hero clicks with dice <laughs> like, or a deck building game with dice, but you're dice building instead of deck building. I mean, they're, they're in the same market segment and they got some experience and they got the manufacturing know-how and they got the street cred to, to get that license. I think that's all that's happening there is you're just seeing somebody new basically get picked up to be to be the guys doing all that stuff. I don't know if they'll do RPGs because I don't think this kid does RPGs, but who knows, we'll see. It's, it's all just a wait and see and find out what they make over time thing. I'm not gonna bother guessing because whatever it is, it's, I can tell you what it's not gonna be. <laughs> it's not gonna be Space Marines. They're not making pre-painted Space Marines. Um, but what it probably is gonna be is gonna be something new and something exciting and I'm jazzed about that. I always like seeing people make something new. Simon Jones says, Mr. Parker, my incursion set arrived today. <laughs> Between you and Dave Taylor, I'm gonna end up doing a throwback Thursday on, on, on incursion, because it's so funny. I, I mentioned incursion in like this like throwaway like comment, and a bunch of people got really excited to hear you mention incursion. The problem with that is, I'm gonna need someone to like, it's like a deep dive into my storage unit. Like not like a little dive into my storage unit. That's a like, I gotta tie a rope around my waist and have somebody with a winch like, ready to pull me back out when it all collapses. Because <laughs> I'm not super sure where it is. I think it's in the board game boxes. I think I actually packed in the board game boxes. I know where all the miniatures are because I actually have them all out because I was going to use them for um, for uh, for a miniature game, which is the, the universe that Incursion is based in is actually the, uh, the oh shoot, something Doomsday. The, I keep wanting to say 1843, but it's 1943. It's a World War II game. It's, eh. <laughs> I can't remember right now. It's, my, it's the West Wind one. I know it's made by West Wind, but I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Someone in the chat showed it out. Uh, because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But it's based in that universe, and I was going to play that game with it. Um, so I have all the models out. It's going to find all the board game parts. But I'm sure I'll find them. Simon, you're crazy. I love you, but you're crazy. Lord Rourke says, board games have a low entry cost and potentially snag people from the main game in the long term. Exactly. Yeah, it bridges a gap. They're, they're, an, easy, they're an easy in. Oh, I've built my first guy. This is Basha. Basha's got the two clubs. I like that all of the orcs are named for what they do. We got Basha, Hakka, Kutta, and then whatever the main dude's name is. I haven't, I haven't remembered yet. <laughs> uh, what else we got? Dan Harris says, any advice for a first time dad to be a bit of a mad one? My girlfriend's 31 weeks pregnant now, so it's getting close. Um, Jonathan Young, Dan, sleep when the kid sleeps, 100%, 100%. Um, and don't be afraid to use the times that you have to be up with the baby. So just do something you like. I, like, 
I played video games a lot with Kat when she was getting fees at three o'clock in the morning because you're awake anyway and your baby just wants you to be with them. So like, there was a lot of like, put a pill in my lap, put the baby on my lap, sit with the controller around her, like play video games, she'd drink a bottle, she'd be fine. Um, but yeah, no, there's like 100% dance right, sleep when they sleep, get your sleep when you can get it because you're not, like there's this like, there's this like terrible trap you get into where you feel like when the baby sleeps when you have to get all the grown up stuff done. No, <laughs> no, that's what swings are for. That's what baby swings are for. Put the baby in the swing, do your grown up stuff. Baby will burble and make noises and be happy uh, or eat or need to be changed or whatever it is and do the grown up stuff when they're awake. Do the sleeping stuff when they sleep, <laughs> 100%. Uh, Jonathan Young is 100% right. Um, Miso Miso says, Ash, I completely agree. I think that GW, Oh geez, I, I like started reading that. I tried to scroll down the chat and then the chat like flew away because I'm way back up in the chat right now apparently. Oh no, <laughs> it's gone horribly wrong. I think that GW are now in the IP creation business and then the ones that stick are the popular ones can be farmed into video game companies. Good business model in my opinion. I, I think just understanding that your IP has value is a great business model, but I, I'm excited that they're, 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 they're basically not restricting themselves to making the same thing over and over again and they're willing to try new things. Uh, S. Monster, go see as many movies as you can now, because not <laughs> there won't be kid movies. Go see grown-up movies. That's yeah, true. Uh, Brutal Top says, "Hey, Chad. Hey, Ash. Sorry, I'm late. Was getting romantically rejected. Oh, geez. Well, that happens. The trick is to just get romantically rejected as many times as you can until somebody says yes. <laughs> it's all about it's a numbers. Was it? Was that from? It's from the the league. <laughs> it's Rafi. It's a numbers game. <laughs> it's always a numbers game. Uh, Jason Peachy says, Wild West Exodus. Yes or no for teaching new players? Um, I haven't played it yet. They reached out to me a long time ago, a couple months ago now, and said they wanted to work together. I haven't heard anything since. <laughs> so if you're in the Wild West Exodus community, know that they reached out and I said, sure, yeah, let's try something. And they even asked me for my local independent retailer so they could try and support them too, um, just to like try and get people to come play me. And then I've heard nothing since then. So I gave them Lord's Wars contact. Uh, they got my contact and then it all went dark. So I don't know what's going on, but I haven't heard anything from them. Um, Inquisitor Shavak says, damn, for the next nine or 10 weeks, your wife is never wrong. <laughs> that too. She's been, it's, uh, yours is like, I, I've never known mine to be wrong anyway. <laughs> uh, what else we got? Everyone's just sounding off, sleep, sleep, sleep. <laughs> hey Ash, any thoughts on Kings of War Vanguard, Aaron Siege asks. Um, yes, I actually got a chance to take a look at the alpha rules. It looks really cool. Um, I'm, I'm excited that it's just, it's familiar enough because it uses the basic Kings of War stat line that like I looked at it and just kind of nodded my head and I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, it seems to fill a bit of the same market niche as uh, Company of Iron does where you've got like a reason to play with your current existing range um, stuff. I was going to give it a try, but then I looked at the army list, the test lists for it, and unfortunately, I don't have any of those models. <laughs> it was like dwarves, goblins, abyssals, and something else and i have like orcs and and ogres so i had no models that were in like the here's the rules for these range um although i do apparently have something from manta coming by ups that should show up shortly so maybe maybe that will let me play vanguard i don't know we'll see uh andrew sokolovic says sokolovic i'm gonna say that wrong i'm really sorry uh speaking of blood bowl i'm currently making a dollar store seraphon team green stuff and armor and dinosaurs and put them on spare bases it's awesome because my local commission says it'll be legal <laughs> there you go i mean that <laughs> that's that's that is exactly the reason why something like blood bowl is still alive and is definitely a board game not a miniature war game because like as long as things are recognizably what they're supposed to be like your crack scores the big guy your little guys are all skanks. Because there's only like three different things in the Lizardmen team. There's a Croc score, there's Lizardmen, and then there's, sorry, there's Sauruses, and then there's skanks. So like, as long as you have big, medium, small, it doesn't, like everyone's gonna know what it is. And then you just use things like base colors for your pro skills, just number everything. Metal King Studio says, Old Hammer probably was the high point for some people because they had time to play and money to spend. Also, sticker flags. Absolutely. Um, so here's the thing. It's, it's funny because I've actually, this is something I have talked about before, is um, the reason why I think certain games stick in people's heads as being like the greatest game ever. They're not actually remembering the game. They're remembering the time in their life in which they got to play that game. And for me, it's funny because I recently played Confrontation again. I liked it. It was a lot of fun. But I really, like, having played, like, I just, this week, actually, I'm gonna upload my thousandth video to YouTube, which is crazy. <laughs> but having spent two years now playing a gajillion different miniature games of all different kinds, and playing Confrontation again recently, um, it's a great game, but it's not, 
it's not necessarily it's not necessarily the the game I remember in my head, right? What I remember in my head is being able to go to my buddy's house after work and sit and play games and watch old like watch like old ECW videos on tape and play like three games of confrontation a night and just shoot the shit and be like these these young guys that didn't have any responsibility. Whereas I couldn't do that at that point. So I think what you're I think what, what it's Sean saying is that you remember this like time in your life that you remember to play them. It's an emotional resonance, right? It's the fact that at that point what you're remembering is that glow of no responsibility, get to do whatever you want. And that's funny, because that's how I remember the Halo video games. I remember the Halo video games super well, because you know we would, we would, my, my roommate would come home from work when I was like 22, and we would sit and drink beer and play Halo on Legendary, like, co like, like couch co-op Halo on Legendary, until like four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and then wake up and go to work and do it all again. Um, Cause like, cause that's it, it's not actually the experience necessarily. It's sorry, it's not necessarily actually the thing you're remembering. It's the experience around the thing that was so enjoyable and was such a great time. Dan Harris says thanks, guys. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Congo the German Gan says Ash is bad for my wallet. Eden Warzone Bushido. The list goes on and on. Yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> Paul Walker says, have you seen Dominion Wars by Vanguard? Three millimeter sci-fi mass armies. No, three millimeter. That's crazy small. That's like, that's half epic scale, which is like, like the dudes are just dots. <laughs> it's going to be really little, but it means you can have like Titans and vehicles and stuff. No, but I'll Google it after, um, after I'm done here and check it out. That sounds neat. Uh, C. Weiss says, do you think we'll see 40k clicks? Absolutely not. You will never see 40k clicks because Games Workshop will never trust anyone else to make miniatures that isn't Games Workshop. And if they do, then I, I officially declare something has gone horribly wrong. Because <laughs> you, can't, you can't be the company that makes the nicest miniatures on Earth and let anybody else make miniatures on your intellectual property. Because all of a sudden, there's, there's second and third class stuff built on your intellectual property that wasn't made by you. Uh, Tao says, hope to see the card. Tao says, hope to see the card game come back. Patrick Cremosa says, hey, Ash, finally caught your live show while I'm at home. Awesome. I usually just knew it would work. Uh, greetings, everyone. Well, greetings to you, Patrick. Uh, and then in question fact, Ash, you're going to play Space Marine after Devil's Titanicus. I am. Yeah, I know. My plan for Titanicus is to just roll through the expansion. So we finished the, I got one mission left to film for just the, the, the original Titanicus box. Then we moved to Codex Titanicus, which adds in. So basically what it adds, is really, it, it actually removes two classes of Warlord Titan. The Night Gauntlet and the Light Eclipse come out and they get replaced by the Reaver and the Warhound. Because statistically speaking, like, like, like rules speaking, the Night Gauntlet Warlord Titan is a warhound. <laughs> it's just a warhound titan, um, and the reaver is the mid-range one, the low, the low class eclipse. Because what it comes down to is hard points and void shields. Because you're, you don't have hull points or like that. How big you are doesn't matter. So um, that's what Codex Titanicus does, and it means that almost every warhound warlord from that point on is a deathbringer, and then everything else is is based in the maniple system. So what I want to do is I want to paint two maniples of titans. I want to paint a loyalist and a, um, a traitor maniple of, of titans, which means two two warhounds, two deathbringers, uh, sorry, two warhounds, one deathbringer, and two reavers on each side. And then I'm, when I get through playing that against each other, then we'll go in and we'll add in um, the infantry and stuff. We'll, we'll crack onto Space Marines, adding some rhinos and some land raiders and some detachments of infantry, and show you how that works. And I've got a whole other set of buildings to do for Space Marine too, which is awesome. Um, and Chris uh, from Way of the Brush actually had a fan send him one of the uh, old Eldar Phantom Titans, so he's going to try and crack that out too at some point, and we'll um, we'll we'll get some Eldar in there too. I don't know if we'll be able to get the Eldar infantry and tanks because I have that again. It's in deep storage. <laughs> Very deep storage, um, but there's a possibility that uh, we'll get some Eldar playing in there as well. Jonathan Young says, Heroclix Epic 40k. Oh, we're just joking about all the Heroclix stuff now. <laughs> Maylove says, is anybody else experiencing video issues? No, not me. Sorry. Uh, Jonathan Young asks, what are we building today? I'm building Shadespire Orcs um, and a Fracted Drop Troop for Infinity. That's what I'm working on right now. Uh, Eight Elias Eight says, "Do you think uh, there's a group of your vi in your Venn diagram that is the stereotypical millennial, a person that hasn't had kids and has been brought uh, sorry hasn't bought a house and has lots of disposable income?" I, I definitely think there's some millennials in there. I think that for the most part, though, a lot of millennials right now are actually are are well. I mean, the, the vast majority of them are playing video games. And that's why you've got like these like <laughs> these like video game barons on Twitch and stuff like that. Guys who are in their early 20s making lots of money streaming videos on YouTube. Um, and that's that I think I think that tends to be uh, a different part of that Venn diagram though. 
is that there's also the the what what attracts you to a, a game um, and what are you used to. And I think a lot of millennials aren't necessarily as used to um, uh, having to. And this is I, I don't mean to sound like this is an indictment. But a lot of the entertainment they're used to in their life cycle, like growing up, they don't have to, to, to put a lot into it to take the entertainment back out. So video games, for instance, don't require any effort from you. For the most part, you don't inject yourself into a video game. You just turn on and you're playing and you're being entertained, right? So, so you're having the inter entertainment projected to you as opposed to you projecting yourself out as entertainment. Whereas miniature wargaming tends to be a lot more, um, it's a lot, it, it asks a lot of you to do it. And so I think it's not necessarily the first port of call for millennials, not because they wouldn't like it, but because they're just not, they're not exposed to it, right? Like if, if that's never something that you're, you're basically shown because the mass market doesn't do it, you're much less likely to approach it as a hobby because you've just never, you've never had the opportunity to be exposed to it. So thank God Games Workshop's out there building more retail stores and showing people miniature wargaming is because otherwise it would just be constantly buried under the, <laughs> the, the constant barrage of, uh, of video games being, being put out there because video games market better, they're way low entry costs. Like everything that I was just talking about board games doing that makes board games attractive to a big target of the market, video games just does better and forever. <laughs> so unfortunately, it's it it it's not necessarily a happy thing, but it's the truth that you're you're always going to be fighting against that stuff, and you're never going to be able to to um, break through 100. percent You can just hope that they get exposed to it somehow, and they decide they like it. Because I think tons of millennials would would love miniature wargaming if they had the chance to see it, but their life experience tends to be dominated by different entertainment types, and so that that just that's just that eats up all the it's all the, all the, even all the, the marketing time, right? Like, it's hard to see other things. Uh, what else we got? Uh, the cat says millennials with disposable income. That's a very small percent. Um, I, I don't think that's true in non-urban areas. I think in, um, I think that's exacerbated by millennials that want to live in like big cities because uh, it's cool to live in big cities or because they're going to school in big cities or whatever. Uh, the, the poor millennial is definitely. Um, a, a truism, they, they make less on average. They come out of school with less opportunity to, to get hired into a high paying job immediately because there's so much competition for them. Like nothing, not, not, nothing that millennials talk about for uh, as far as like they're starting off basically behind is wrong. My, my least favorite thing is how in debt they end up being because they get offered credit cards when they're 18 with like no limits. <laughs> and they get offered student loans, no limits either, they go to school. But then immediately they start off with debt. So like, it, it's, it's, it's like, for a lot of millennials, it's they're, they're done before they start. Um, that being said, I think that the disposable income we're talking about here is that money that you would spend going to the bar or going to see a concert or whatever anyway. It, even when even when times are tough, you've still got that little bit of money left over that you use to make yourself happy. Because otherwise, you go crazy. <laughs> Not every one of those dirt poor. Um, Ian Torrin says, "Hey Ash, true. We remember games fondly for emotional reasons. I still have fantasy, but the time to set up a full six by four and twenty five hundred points aside is sh <laughs> is short. Max three by three tabletops the best option for me these days. I I think that's interesting because it's I'm I'm very much the same way. I'm super jazzed that this week I'm playing nothing but like miniature board games. I'm playing Shadespire. I'm playing Aristia, um, and the other two games I'm playing this weekend I'm playing some Infinity and some Alpha." So the biggest game I'm playing is Infinity, which is, Infinity's funny because it has a big, it has a big ask from the table point of view, but the game is still only like 10, 12 minutes. Like it's not that many dudes that you have to put down to play a game and the game still plays relatively quickly too. Uh, what else we got? Oral Corzel asks, the follow-up question to is OFC, if you think it will affect other game companies focus or see it as a side thing, or will they meet this type of focus? So I think we're always asking about the the board this board game this miniature board game jump this big push by all these companies to try and get into that market. Um, I don't think it's gonna be a focus. I think it's gonna be something that they continue to support because they want to keep that bridge open. So so if, if what you're asking me is, do I think that Shade Spire is just gonna dry up six months from now? No, I don't think so. I think what you might see is in three years, if Shadespar gets really big, right? Like, and when I say big, I don't mean like popular. I mean, there are tons of warbands, tons of cards, and it, it gets to the point where like the game is 
ponderous, I think what you'll see happen is you'll, you'll see something like the set rotations in Magic start to happen, where there'll be like seasons, right? Where like, what happens is there'll be a new starter set for Shadespire, all new warbands, and, and a new sort of like us getting to play the game. Um, and our old stuff will still be va will still be valid in like extended formats and stuff like that, but it's not going to be valid from a, we can play this all the time. This is the official tournament way to play it. Way of doing it because you don't keep a game fresh that way. Like you don't necessarily get to um, do the, the 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 ongoing sales without over tipping the game. Just it'd be like Magic where the game just got too top heavy and there's too many cards, and you wouldn't be able to do it forever. Uh oh, the boy's awake. Give me a second. Let's go see what's going on with him because he's fussing. And we're back. Well, the boy would not be denied, so it's all, we're having some, yeah, he's watching Minions. We're having some iPad and uh, cucumber snacks while he watches Minions on my iPad, and we'll finish this up. Um, so we were at, finally remembering games, blah, 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 blah. Congo the German guy says, well, skirmish games without a bunch of rules, like infinity, but simple rules for skirmish games, yes. Um, and then Kablam says the official games workshop tournament pack doesn't require painted minis for Shadespire, so that's definitely a thing. Um, I agree. I think that's going to be um, going forward. One of the things that makes it accessible is that it doesn't require painted miniatures. What I like though is that every single team so far has been a different color of plastic because what that lets you have is it lets you have a um, uh, an readily identifiable army without having to have a uh, what should we call it a um, uh, you know, a painting requirement basically. You want to be able to at a glance know what faction you're looking at, and I like the colored plastic for that reason. Congo says, I don't think Shadespire would survive long enough if they didn't have a long term incentive to buy packs. 
Well, there's a lot of like, um, whatchamacallit, there's a lot of, uh, of, of universal cards. It's funny, I just went through, and I'm actually writing an article right now that is gonna become a video this week on how to organize your cards for Shadespire, because I think that's a whole, a whole art form right now. And a lot of miniature board gamers aren't necessarily big board gamers, don't necessarily know how to do that stuff. Um, so I'm doing a big, I'm doing a big push right now to refresh myself on it. And I've gone through and I've actually categorized all of the, all of the cards for Shadespire into different, different plays. So how do they play on the battlefield? Um, and what do they build into? They build into offense, defense, positioning, or tech. So like control stuff, like controlling other people's models, controlling how you get it on the battlefield, stuff like that. And there will definitely be a video coming up for that in the near future, because I've gone and organized it all. Uh, Kablam says, we'll have to see what color the second Corn and Stormcast Warbands are gonna be. So here's my bet. I'm betting they're red and blue. I'm betting they're not different colors. And the reason for that is, I'm betting their cards can be used by either Warbands. I would be really surprised if the second card sets for um, Stormcast, for the Vanguard, and for the Corn aren't, aren't just usable on both sides. Except for the name ones, obviously, they're attached name characters. I'm betting absolutely every single card can be used by everything else. You dropped your juice box, pick it up, buddy. I got it. You got it? Good job. He's crushing out the the self the self-sufficiency right now, getting his juice box ready. So yeah, I know the um the the thing that would surprise me a lot is if they don't incentivize existing players by by doing this. And that leaves lots of room then to do the same thing with the orcs. You could do bone splitters and have their cards be usable with the the these guys. Um, you could do um, clan Eshin stuff for the Skaven, have you usable in the initial stuff. And that way, instead of just going deeper into the same faction, you can go wider as well. All right, here's two Warbands, all with access to all these cards. And it means that you've got a double whammy reason to go and buy them now. So I'd be very, very surprised if you couldn't, if, if you weren't compatible, basically, between those two teams. I, won't, I don't think they're ever gonna let you have team selection, so the teams are gonna remain the same. You're playing, uh, you know, Steelheart's Champions, or you're playing, I can't remember the other guy's name, Vanguard's Vanguardians, or whatever it's gonna be, um, where, uh, where you have to pick those fighters, basically, in your team, but the cards are gonna cross-populate, except for all the named ones, inside those factions, and it's just gonna give you a bigger card selection inside those factions. I was actually surprised, when I sorted through all the currently existing cards, I thought there was gonna be more universals than there are. There's actually way more faction cards uh, for ploys and for upgrades than there is um, in the universal deck, which I think is actually pretty good. And a lot of factions actually had card duplication too. There's a lot of factions that have a plus one wound card. There's a lot of factions that have a plus one move card. So it's interesting because they're giving people access to that, but they're not giving everybody access to those cards because those cards would just be universally in certain decks otherwise. Um, what is interesting though is there is a generic plus one move card but there's also plus one move cards that are faction specific, which means you could technically double down because they have different names, which I think is gonna be really neat too. So we'll see. Uh, Oral Cardinal says, original question, do you think the other game companies will follow the new Spire thinking to get peeps to get into miniature wargaming? Um, well, I mean, some have already, right? Like if, if you're looking at um, Corvus Belly, Aristaya is very much in the same market segments. Um, what I love for Aristaya, which is something they are way ahead of Games Workshop for doing it right now, is they've already got an online tournament manager for Aristaya. The Warcores already have a program for running the event. Um, they are, and like, you can actually register and play in Aristide events using your current ITS badge, which means that like, there's, there's already a system in place for when Aristide drops to have like a world champion for Aristide, to have an ELO system for all the players. Like there's way more networking already in place for Aristide um, than there is for Shadespire, which I'm really stoked about. And I actually really want to run an Aristide tournament at um, the Geekery. I ran my last tournament there, it was a Dark Age tournament. I want to do Shadespire and Aristaya. So if you guys are in Southern Ontario or near Southern Ontario and you want to have an event, I in the new year want to do both those things. So get painted, because it's going to be painted only, because I'm a snob and I only play with painted events. <laughs> and we'll see how that goes. Um, Jonathan Young says, oh sorry, Kablam says, so we have Corpus Belly, Fantasy Play Games, Games Workshop. Um, uh, are there others? You've got Steamforge Games. They've got their um, their latest Guild Ball. Like the core so for Guild Ball is a board game. Everything's in cardboard. All the What's up, buddy? Oh, did you break it? Okay, hang on. Bring it over here. <laughs> Bring it over here, buddy. Bring me the iPad. Bring me the iPad. Bring it over here. This is why you don't touch the screen. Oh, he minimized it. All right, hang on. <laughs> One second. I'll be right back. Gotta go tech support.
<laughs> <We're> back. <laughs> had to had to had to re unminimize that screen. Um, yeah, I know. So so you've got um, Steamforge doing it with a whole bunch of their games. You got Corvus Belly doing it. Um, who else did I just have on the title screen? There was somebody else I had in the title screen there. Oh, The Walking Dead even. The Walking Dead's got it with their um, their current range of uh, of all at war stuff. They've got a new one coming out too, which is their uh, um, it's it's a miniature war game version of uh, like a sorry a um, science fiction version of their dungeon saga game. So set in like the universe of Dead Zone, um, it's like an infiltrate an evil corporate base, space zombies and <laughs> other other evil bad things going on um, type game. There's going to be all kinds of stuff in that market. I I dude, all kinds of companies are looking at it. But I think what's interesting is the bigger companies are doing it right now. You've got uh, Corpus Belly, Games Workshop, Steam Forged, and these are all companies that are actually really good at doing competitive games. Mantic, they're kind of the oddball in that situation, doing, but they've actually done lots of miniature board games already. They've done the Walking Dead game, which has been really successful for them. Um, what's different is they don't do the organized play stuff the way the three do. So I think what you're going to see is those three have gotten there first. Um, and they have they all have plans to make these successful based on like organized play and stuff too So we'll see we'll see where it gets to but I think what you're seeing is you're seeing If the big companies think it's a good idea and they see a lot of success doing it That's when the other little companies start to take notice and I'll say the imitators But like people people try and get in that market segment the difference is games workshop can make that risk Corpus Belly can take that risk Steamforge can take that risk and some smaller companies can't because obviously you, you want to go for a sure thing. And in this miniature wargaming market, people that already like miniature war games are a much surer thing than hoping you make a product that bridges a gap between different parts of the industry. So we'll see. X-Wing was definitely also in that target market um, and has done very well and has continued to do very well. So they're not, they're not the only companies doing it. Um, I think that they're just the ones that you can, you can see making the big moves right now. Glam says, yeah, I forgot about Guild Ball. Yeah, no, Guild Ball's... I mean, what's great is I, I did a... I think I did an unboxing of the Guild Ball... Uh, most recent team, the Blacksmiths, for you guys, and it's straight up a board game expansion. Like it's six pre-built players. All the cards are in there in six languages, and all of your tokens are in there too. There's punch card tokens for every effect and thing in the game. So like you literally don't, and it's all colored plastic too. So like you don't need anything out of that box to not just be able to go to a guild ball tournament and be like, I'm playing Blacksmiths, let's do this, and you're ready to rock and roll. And the same with the farmers. So once all the teams are like that for guild ball they're they're literally like 100 percent able to to just sit on a shelf board game style and be ready to rock and roll and he just took off i'm like i have no idea where he just went <laughs> hopefully he doesn't come back with something terrible like a shovel and just and just hammer me in the back of the head for something i did earlier what are you doing buddy oh no, oh, no. what's up I'm garbage. you gotta put the garbage in the garbage oh did you put it in the garbage good job buddy put your juice box in the garbage when i got you well trained they can be well trained it just takes a long time and for him, it's mostly not trained. <laughs> What's up, pal? What are you looking for? What do you want? Uh, say what you want. You want your trains? Trains. Trains, say please. All right, let's get trains. Oh, hang on. oh, that was your head cracking off something. Oh, there we go. There you go, pal. Play trains. And now we're playing trains. <laughs> Only slightly distracted. <laughs> uh, Kablam says, would you consider Dead Dones to be a board game? That's the one with the squares on the table, right? It, it's it's more of a miniature war game. What I'm saying is the new one that they're coming out with, Star something, Star Siege. They just written a Kickstarter for it a few months ago. It hasn't delivered yet. It's a board game. It's straight up like a Hero Quest style miniature board game. So we'll see what happens with that. Metal King Studio says, for smaller companies, making sure your product has a point of reference is super helpful. With Shades Bar, for example, you can hear people everywhere getting super confused. Um, there was as much Nathan and Teeth that thought, people thought it was gonna be Mordheim. 100% <laughs> true, people thought that that game was gonna be Mordheim, and it, 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 I think the problem was the story for Shades Fire even kind of sounds like Mordheim. You've got this destroyed city, you've got kind of like a gold rush of people going to it, trying to find stuff, and People, people didn't just think Mordheim like for no reason. People thought Mordheim because it, it really sounded like it was going to be Mordheim. And then it just wasn't. It was something else instead. All right, so let's jump into the mailbag real fast and take some questions. And we got about half an hour left. And then we're going to jump back and say goodbye to everybody in the chat. Oh, I'll jump back and forth to the chat and see what's what. First name, that thing on your foot asks. 
<laughs> Will the co-op expand in the future uh, as so you increase your studio space? Probably not, because if anything, the co-op the co is just becoming me. <laughs> it's just turning into my studio. Um, oh, it's me and Owen for the most part at this point. Mike is doing his own thing, um, and he just had a baby and stuff too, so he's super busy. I don't think we're gonna necessarily expand as much as I'm just gonna continue to, to make the space bigger so I can do more stuff. Um, I know and I continue to collaborate and he's still part of the co-op and part of the studio, but I don't think we're gonna take on more people because it doesn't, we don't need to. <laughs> it's just more to manage at that point. Um, and I've always just wanted this to just be me, right? So it's, it's me doing my thing, Owen doing his thing. Um, and then we collaborate, you know, all the time because it's more fun to do things together. Really? I don't, I don't think we need to expand that much more. Dr. Coors Harm says, could you do a video discussing the thought process on deployment for infinity? Um, I could do a video like that. I, I think we just, we've talked about it quite a bit. I don't think instead of doing a video for that, I'm much more likely to talk about that in something like a podcast. We have to actually do that though, which we will eventually do. Um, again, it's just about finding time and getting through current projects and not having a massive backlog. <clears throat> Salad Lightly Toss with Pacific Style Dressing says, so Steam Forge just hands Mortician's Hemlock, but gives the Hunter's Minx. Seems fair, right? Thoughts? <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing is forever. Season four will come, and then it's all back on the table, dude. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. If, if you get Minx for, sorry, if you get Hemlock for a while, um, and Minx for a while, nothing means that season four doesn't just change everything again. That's actually the great thing about, about Guild Ball is the game itself is fluid enough because they're not afraid to do big sweeping addition changes um, quickly that anything that's imbalanced in the game does not stay imbalanced for very long. And there's gonna be so many new teams coming out in the next little while too uh, with finishing off of um, the farmers and then finishing up blacksmiths as well and then on to the next team that i think we're gonna have to worry about that so i finished all four of my orcs we're done whoop, whoop, whoop. we got two left um and that was pretty quick that was pretty painless too they all slotted together really nicely it was super easy and i'm pretty just paying them i haven't painted orcs in forever i'm gonna build this throck to drop group now and see what's up with that your name, <laughs> too close for missiles, switching to guns, a top gun reference, I'm into it. How do you best fight the war against bare plastic? I need help getting my opponents to paint their toy soldiers. So, here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with, 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 you, 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 <laughs> the, the natural instinct of people, I think unfortunately in a game that is inherently competitive, there's a winner and a loser in tabletop war gaming, is to is to imply that people that don't paint with toy soldiers are in some way losing or that they're not doing it right or not getting the best out of their 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 what they can do i guess and i don't think that works very well you're not gonna get anybody to want to paint their miniatures by making them feel bad uh i i've had lots and lots of experience trying to get people to paint toy soldiers and back back in the day and when it was um uh, you know, early days, early early 2000s, late 90s at Games Workshop, the best way to get people to paint toy soldiers was play games with them. And, and that was back when we didn't have, we didn't allow non-painted uh, miniatures to be played with in the store, which I honestly still think was the biggest mistake Games Workshop ever made, was letting people play unpainted in their own stores. Um, because it gave you something to aspire to. And, and it meant that you'd come in, you'd get help. People, you know, the, the staff didn't just, the staff would sit down and help you with everything too. Like it wasn't like you're on your own to do it. But you paint up your stuff, and there was always a reward was you got to play. Now, now replicating that time today, I think, is really difficult because that bar is not there anymore, right? Like, you can play anywhere with any level of painted miniature um, from your local gaming store, which probably always let you play with unpainted models, through the Games Workshop stores let you play with unpainted models and stuff, too, because they don't want to detract from your experience and not let you play. And I think that's fine, but I think that you're missing then that little something that incentivizes people. So my favorite way of doing that, um, unfortunately requires you to run events. And I don't say unfortunately that's a bad thing, but you, you, need to be able to, you need to be able to have something that they want to do to incentivize them to try and paint. Um, and, and that means usually going to a tournament. Because if, if people are very into the game, because a lot of people will just paint naturally, they'll just do it and they'll, they'll want to do it and they'll enjoy doing it. But some people don't feel that way. Um, and they naturally don't want to paint the toy soldiers. They just want to play the game and win. 
Well, then in my experience, the best way to incentivize them to actually play the toy soldiers is just making pain part of winning. <laughs> and that might be unpopular. It might not be something that they like, but it is a way of doing it. Um, I don't think that that means soft scores necessarily because people will instantly go, oh, what he means is you know, there's going to be a painting score at the tournament and blah, blah, blah. No, I don't think that's going to be part of it. It doesn't have to be part of it. It could be a small part of it. I like the way ITC does it where it's the tiebreaker, basically. Scoff, soft scores are the difference between being the best at one thing and being just the best general. So the best overall, um, the soft scores will often break that tie. Um, but what I do is typically I get great prize support for all of my events, like really great prize support. But then I just make you eligible to win the prize point if you're painted. <laughs> so stuff like really cool raffle prizes and really cool door prizes and miniatures and scenery and terrain. I'm always on the lookout for companies that are willing to, to, to throw that stuff um, into my events. Uh, one, is good advertising for them, but two, because it's a great way to get communities to play painted and to do all parts of the hobby because winning is cool. Cool stuff is cooler than winning. <laughs> um, and that's what I do is I make it so that you can only, you can only actually win uh, the overall by, or sorry, the, um, the big prizes by having a painted army. And it means that the people that came that didn't necessarily have a painted army and might have gotten trashed in the tournament also get something to go home and feel good about, right? They get to win prizes for painting, but they also win stuff for like, uh, you know, being, being completed, being, having done the whole experience basically. Mr. Kalubo says, hey Ash, uh, you really need to play This Is Not A Test with the Cooler. Keep the good work, my friends. Well, that would require him to want to do it. <laughs> uh, not that I, I don't think he doesn't want to do it, but Owen tends to like competitive games a lot. Um, he likes, and he likes, when, in campaign games, he tends to like fantasy more than sci-fi. Like, he's just a bigger fantasy fan than a sci-fi fan. I find, and that's I think why Mordheim hit it off for him so big, was Mordheim had so much, there was so much like material for it, and he just likes fantasy stuff. Like he's, he's always reading fantasy books and stuff too. Ian Torrin says, problem with Games Workshop's painting policy was the tournament seemed defaulting to 2,000 points and big regiments. It was such a slog to paint 200 goblins, although I always did. I mean, that's not a problem though, because that's a choice. Like painting 200 goblins is a choice. You didn't have to paint 200 goblins, you play ogres. <laughs> like, you, can always, you can always play ogres. There's always, there's always a reason though, I think, to, to say it's a bad idea. But at the same time, I think that you, you, you devalue the holistic part of the hobby if you don't have people play painted. And also, you're, it, it, as much as, it, 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 you never make 100% of people happy, right? Because for every person you let play unpainted, there's gonna be a person that worked really hard to, to paint his miniatures and make them look really nice, that gets really disappointed when he plays four games against unpainted armies. So it's like, you can make the people that don't wanna paint happy, but at the same time, you're, you're by proxy pushing down the happiness of someone that feels the opposite, you know, like there's, there isn't a good, there isn't a good place. There's no, there's no compromise. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's, you have to choose one or the other, but you have to accept the fact that you're going to make one of those sides not as happy as they possibly could be, unfortunately. And back to this. Mr. Kula says, just make him do it. <laughs> we Green Scotty says, more Rumble Slam. I got a, I got Mike from, um, Black Knight that said he's gonna come play Rumble Slam and then never came, back, never got back to me. We're, I've been supposed to be playing Rumble Slam for a while now, uh, and I haven't heard from Mike at all. So, Mike, if you're watching, message me and play some Rumble Slam, dude. Uh, what's next? <clears throat> that deaf, dumb, and blind kid sure plays a mean guild ball. Oh, it's that's so good. That's a Who reference and a guild ball reference all thrown together. That's just I don't know who you are, but kudos. That's that's well done. Hey Ash, that's on Steamforge Games, expanding into licensed board games. Yes, improving their tech, but very different requirements than the original commu uh, community. I, I think that that's a lot of what I'm talking about today, is um, Steamforge wants to be a big company. And by going after the board game market, and especially by doing licensed board games with tons of recognition, they have grown spectacularly fast. You, you gotta think, like, in 2015, nobody knew who these guys were. Guild Bowl is as old as my studio is, for the most part. I mean, they've existed in other forms up to that point, but like, to be, to be like, a, to be recognized as like a gaming company, they're only like two to three years old, and they have grown spectacularly fast in that time. And a big part of that, I think, is being smart with their money and smart what they've invested in. And they've invested in a big market segment. I think they realized early on that miniature wargaming was never going to make them rich, um, and because it's never going to make anybody rich. 
Uh, and instead, they decided that they were going to try and get into a different market. And they've gone into board games, and it's gone super well for them. I mean, we're talking about multi-million dollar Kickstarters. That's a big number for, for any business. Having a couple of a million bucks in investment income, that's a lot. Dark Souls did really well. This Raccoon City thing seems to be doing pretty well. Um, it's not personally my cup of tea, the Raccoon City one. I enjoyed Dark Souls, although... I think there was some, I think there was some ideas of what Dark Souls were going to be, maybe by some people that backed it, that that it wasn't. It was a lot more of the video game than it was Hero Quest. I think there was some ideas that it was going to be more Hero Questy than the video game. It's a very very well written game though, and it definitely gives the experience of the video game really well. Um, but I think they're doing great, man. They're killing it as far as just like running their business and growing and making good business decisions. So good for them. Uh, Ian Torrance says, if more tournaments were narrative um, with smaller force size, then we maybe have a GW Regiment based game. Grumble, 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 bitter face. I, I mean, I think that's what you're starting to see in Shadespire. I don't think Shadespire is it, obviously, because Shadespire is a miniature board game, not a miniature war game. But at the same time, it, it's a lower model count, lower requirement thing. You might see something like that happen for Necromunda. You get a campaign weekend for Necromunda happening it's, um, at Warhammer World, and all of a sudden, people start doing it other places. It might start happening in places like Adepticon. And then all of a sudden that starts to get popular and it grows. It just takes one thing to make things grow. Paulus One says the Warm Hordes Slow Grow League. I'm in has a painting pledge for every three weeks that gives points for painting your pledge. <laughs> My son is currently having three small signs fight. Okay. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's like a street crossing sign, a train track sign, and a stop sign are all having an argument right now. That's awesome. Uh, painting three minis in three weeks, I think, Paulus, is definitely not a big a big ask. And like I said, if it means I see more painted War Machine games, I think that's awesome. I have no, I have no problem with anything that lets me see more painted War Machine games. I would much rather see them. Michi1d6 uh, says, did you see the Dark Tower and what did you think? Well... <sighs> I, I did, I thought it was super weird that they basically just skipped to the last book, although I should have known because it was called The Dark Tower, which is the name of the last book. They basically just skipped everything that made the books good, <laughs> which kind of sucks. They skipped to the end. So like, I enjoyed the movie, but I have all the background that lets me enjoy the movie because I've read all the books. I think it didn't do well in box offices because like, you needed a ton of background to be able to recognize why like, why is that guy's face like falling off and there's rat skin underneath it? Like what's going on with this that, that makes this all make sense? So I, as much as I wanted to like it and I enjoyed it for what it was, I can see why it didn't do very well at the box office because it, like, it was like it was just made for Dark uh, Tower fans and wasn't made to be like a good movie in and of itself. So it had a lot of potential, great actors, even great acting. It was just let by down by, by not being the gunslinger. It should have just been the gunslinger. And you should have just made seven movies. Sorry. Should have just done it. Um, Oral asks about 3D printers. How do you think this will affect mini sellers in 10 years? Unless we, unless we end up with the, the Star Trek replicators in our houses, it's not going to affect them at all. Um, I have a good buddy, Mike, who's not here right now, weirdly, because he's almost always on my live shows, who loves 3D printing. He is, he, he, I've learned more about 3D printing and just the market of 3D printing in the last, like, like, year and a half, two years since we've known each other than I ever did before. And he's confirmed everything that I think about, <laughs> about 3D printing. He loves doing it. He's an incredibly smart guy. He's going to yell at me now for even talking about him like this. Um, he's incredibly talented, like, um, uh, in computers, right? Lee works in computers, knows tons about computers. So he knows a lot about the back end of how something like a 3D printer works. And even for him, he realizes the limitations in, in 3D printing stuff. And he buys tons of miniatures. He doesn't do it, he's not doing it to try and get miniatures cheaper or to, to circumvent buying and building and painting miniatures. He's just doing it because he loves the technology. And his assessment of the whole thing is that Unless it's like I instantly have a miniature in front of me with the push of a button, it's not going to it's not going to replace miniature wargaming because there's still like there's just simple things like convenience and time. It takes a long time to print a miniature, and even longer time to print a miniature of this quality. If you don't care what your miniature looks like, then you can still just play with Legos. But Legos are still going to be cheaper than 3D printing your miniatures. Um, 
Yeah, so I think there's definitely, it's its own like hobby market. But I think that those people that are using 3D printers to play war games are probably more 3D printing enthusiasts first and war gamers second. And I don't think that's, that Venn diagram is ever gonna push to the point where it pushes one out, basically. Like the miniature war gamers are always gonna be there, even in 10 years. Um, and what else we got? Frozor says, Ash, it's been a while. Man, your channel's regrown. Nice to see you streaming. I have a buttload of videos to catch up on. Yeah, I'm about to do, I'm, I'm gonna have my thousandth video this week, which is crazy. Uh, Andy Wang says, your son is playing Street Sign Fighter. That's, that's exactly what he's doing. That's fantastic. <laughs> now he's currently checking out a tower of books um, and making something out of them. I don't know. I love, I love two-year-olds because they just, they have the most active imagination. It's incredible. It's really incredible. Um, and we're just about ready to finish. <laughs> Metal King Studios asks, did 3D, did 2D printers kill card games? <laughs> That's true, I guess you could. You could print them all, yeah. Uh, you can print in paper, it's fun, but it's different. <laughs> Did 2D printers kill card games? I haven't heard that as an argument before, but Sean, I'm gonna use that from now on. I think it's a fantastic, uh, an, old, an old fantastic question. Did, did your 2D printer kill card games? It didn't, obviously. Um, although you could just go and print every magic card in existence and just play magic with printed cards. Pretty sure they're not legal in tournaments though, if you, have, if you don't have real cards for magic. <laughs> That makes me so happy. <laughs> Did 2D printers. You just made my day, Sean. That's like the best argument ever. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, <laughs> S Monster says 3D printing is great for parts. Absolutely. I, I, I'm not saying it doesn't have its place in miniature wargaming, but it's its own niche. I think it's also its own hobby, too. It's definitely its own, like, there's the, the people that like 3D printing love 3D printing. And they love it as a hobby in and of itself because I think it merges, again, it overlaps a Venn diagram of. I love I love toy soldiers and miniatures, but I also love this like computer and, and production side of things. How do I get these two interests to overlap? And it's 3D printing toy soldiers, so in and of itself. Uh, Matthew Shepard asks, context relevant to Relic Blade. So context relevant to Relic Blade. I paid for the monster cards even though I could have just printed them out with the Seekers handbook. Convenience and quality trumps doing it yourself. It's true, right? Like I I mean I could I could get them off the website, I could finagle the graphics in Photoshop, I could send them off to Vistaprint to have like a deck of cards made of them, but it's not the same as like getting to open a cool foil pack that Sean made of like individual cards and like deal them out and have official relic. Like, and you know what's funny? In the back of my head, I'll always know they're not real. You know, like there'll be this thing in the back of my head where I'm like, these are knockoffs. <laughs> <laughs> like they're not a, they're not real they're not real relic blade cards and that would always like bother me um Mail says and also 3d printing is an engrossing hobby in and of itself and doesn't necessarily make for people who want to work do war games and stuff absolutely yeah <laughs> Ian Torrance says 3d printing killed my mother and pooped on my father well now we've just jumped the shark <laughs> all right well the boy's up you know what i've gone through all of the server monkey questions for this week the boy is now awake and terrorizing the living room which means i probably should pay attention to him and be a good parent and i'll just document the fact that he can entertain himself with an ipad forever um so i'm gonna sign off uh and thank you guys for hanging out and watching this is a very interesting discussion i really enjoyed talking about the miniature board games and just like i like it when things are new and things start to collide and this is like industry colliding and also new market stuff, I think is why I'm really excited about it. It's something people haven't done before. What I'm really jazzed for is the organized play around it. I really want to play in and run a Shadespire tournament. I really want to play in and run an Aristide tournament. Like, I have played in and run Guild Ball tournaments before. All three of those things make me excited. It's gonna be it's gonna be a neat year. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. We will um, hang out with the boy now and then get ready to go see the girl in a bit and pick her up from school. Um, so you guys have a great rest of your day. I'll see you next week for another piece of ash. Be with my patrons next time. Daddy. So if you're a patron, oh, and there he is. You gonna say bye bye? Bye bye. <laughs> say bye bye everybody. Bye bye everybody. Look up there. Look up there. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. We'll see you next week. Uh, we're gonna go get Katina. Yeah. Can you bump it? Can you bump it for everybody? Yeah, can you say let's do it? Let's do it. All right, so we're going to go and eat more cucumbers and hang out for a bit and then go get the girls. So anyway, happy Robin, guys. Uh, we'll see you next week. Join me if you're one of the patrons, and you'll be able to see it live afterwards. Uh, the new mailbag link will be in the video description. Um, and until then, I'm Ash. What? Those are scissors. Those are miniature clippers. You're not going to touch those. Anyway, until next time, guys. Happy Robin. Thank you,